let the people come to the stadium and let them enjoy themselves. As long as you look to a certain way of playing, everybody can play. Getting the ball, treat the ball well, let it be your friend. When they saw us playing, everybody was happy. They just went home laughing. If you can laugh and enjoy yourself, it's one of the most important things there is. Johan Cruyff, he was football's enigma. Not only would he ghost past defenders like they weren't there, he would outwit them too. Like a mathematician on the field, he always managed to find another angle. There would always be another dimension to his play. He had the perfect combination of intelligence and skill. He was very intelligent and had an overview of the whole game. And there aren't many that have that ability. There were some, but he was on another level. He was a quick player with extraordinary ability and he had sensational vision. He made football into an art form and Johan represented modernity, that winning spirit. He was, yeah, he was special. It was in Vatergrafsmeer, in the east of Amsterdam, that Johan Cruyff grew up in the 1950s. His home was close to the old Ajax Stadium, which was appropriate for such a talented kid. But there were some tough moments in childhood for the youngster. My father died when I was 12, which means that my second father was uh, taking care about the field of Ajax. My mother was working there, which means that, uh, well, in between school times, from 12 to 2 or whatever, when you eat, you, you went there. Which means it's, yeah, almost second home. He learned on the street, like me. You know, most of the players from Ajax, they come from the street. He lived 500 meters from, from the stadium. He was like a son of an ass. He was a real, real Amsterdam boy, you know? He was a real man of Amsterdam. Then I was on the field and he was behind. He shoot the ball back to the trainers and he was always running and playing with the little guys. He was a small friend of all the players, you know. They were older, they were, yeah, they, they just guide me in the good things and in the bad things. When I had a good game and I talked a little too much, it was like, it's, shut up or you'll find you. The youngster, though, was something of a prodigy. Cruyff made his debut at the age of 17, scoring in his first match and making a name for himself on equal terms with the men he'd once seen as father figures. They were players for the first team. And, of course, they were the idols of uh, all young players at that, uh, at that stage. But at the same time, I, I saw them every day. So when I went into the first team, everybody says, were you nervous? I said, well, I, I wasn't nervous. I, I went in the dressing room all the time as a young kid. It was just so natural, so, so, so automatic. By 1966, Ajax were dominating the Dutch league. They won the Ere Division with a little help from their young centre forward, who got 25 goals in 23 games. Well, first of all, we had a good team at that time. Uh, there were some very good players and I was quite, at that time, still quite selfish. I knew where I had to go. Uh, my control was very quick because that's what I had to do my whole life, otherwise I would never have come to the first team. So it was quite easy to score these goals. It was just based on my quality. He was fantastic. He was so smart. He knows where the ball is coming. He saw everything. And he can play on every place in the team. The 1960s were pioneering days for Ajax. Renus Mikkels and his talented squad were developing a fluid style of play, a system that would become the celebrated total football. Shaggy, this is young. 
With a scholarly air, through method and precision, Michels became the master, commanding respect from his attentive pupils. And in Cruyff, Michels had the perfect player to put his ideas into action on the pitch. He was Ajax's star. But there were times when even Johan Cruyff was brought back down to earth. The trainer say, no smoking, Michels. And we, we come from the training in the car and we drive 200 meters and he stop with the car. And he make uh, cigarettes and he smoke the cigarette after the training. <laughs> We had to do some training in the, in the woods, running, and I hated running. The second goalkeeper and myself, we were uh, behind the tree, smoking a cigarette until they were coming by. And then one day, we were just smoking, and then the coach was behind the, the tree. So he said to me, uh, next day was the day off. Next day, you've got to train because we can't accept that and all these sort of things. I was there on the place at 7 o'clock. Then the coach came in his car, in his pyjama. He said, it's too early, it's too cold, bye-bye. So he turned around, went home again. And I was there looking like a fool. Whatever went on behind the scenes in Amsterdam, Michels and Cruyff were going places. And in 1969, Ajax made it to the final of the European Cup, where they met AC Milan. We had to pass the first uh, final of the European uh, Cup. At that time, was uh, in Madrid against Milan and uh, we lost there. Not because we were worse, but the experience was not there. But you have to go through these mistakes. You had to learn from it. And then the great period started in 71. It was a bright London evening at Wembley Stadium, June the 2nd, 1971. It turned out to be the first defining moment for Johan Cruyff and his Ajax side. It was the beginning of the Ajax era, where the likes of Real Madrid and Benfica once ruled, European competition would now be dominated by a small club from the east of Amsterdam. The Ajax at that time was still in their organisation, an amateur club. I think maybe 10 or 20 persons were working there. You didn't have directors, you didn't have, no, 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 there was a president. And then, yeah, people who did it in their, in their spare time. A year on, in 1972, Ajax were preparing for another final, this time with a new coach, Stefan Kovacs, in charge. It was Ajax against Internazionale at the De Kuyp Stadium in Rotterdam. And in the second half, Cruyff took the game to the Italians. You knew that wherever you went, uh, you had somebody marking you, wherever you, wherever you go. And it just was waiting for the moment to be alert to do what you have to do. If you do something, he will react. And that's what I had uh, when I scored a goal with my head. Two goals from Cruyff brought Ajax their second European Cup. They were now in a period of phenomenal success and there was never any doubting who was the jewel in the crown. Johan was, echt een, uh, leider, uh, Johan was a natural born leader. He was the driving force of Ajax and our team. He always had that in him and this was very important to Ajax. It was Johnny Rep who scored the goal in 1973 that beat Juventus in Belgrade. Three in a row for Ajax and Johan Cruyff. It was a fantastic achievement because I think, I don't know, not a lot of clubs did it. So you, you came into a select group of clubs within Europe. I play seven, eight years with him. And we win three times the European Cup together. And that's the, he was the best. But this was to be the last time that Cruyff would hold the European Cup as a player. Despite the celebrations, there were problems behind the scenes, which meant that Ajax's star had to move on. 
from the club on, there was no discipline. For nobody, not from the president to the players, not from the players to the coach, not to the coach to this. It was a pity because they, I think they could have held a few more years. You can get angry, that's what I did, and I uh, tried to keep these things together, but it was almost uh, impossible after these, uh, after these three cups. So in 1973, the European Player of the Year, the best player in the world at the time, chose to sign for Barcelona. For the locals, the arrival of Cruyff and the impact he had was as good as a miracle. When Johan arrived here in Barcelona, the club was going through, let's say, a strange period. Even though we were playing well and had good players, we weren't winning anything. But when Cruyff arrived, in the footballing sense, it was like the Big Bang, which really reactivated the team. The transformation was not to go back and have a look what happens, no, go out there and just try to win and win. Barcelona at that time had some good players, but they, they, they didn't think like that. And, and the moment they start thinking like that, it was a very good team. Back then, Barcelona hadn't won the league for 14 years. The club and the city needed a saviour. I remember it all from the very first day he arrived. Barcelona was second from bottom and the first match was against Granada at home. We won 4-0 and Johan scored two goals and we didn't lose a single game until we were champions. That league of 73-74 was the best memory of my childhood. It was sensational. It was a season full of sensational moments, like the goal that Cruyff scored against Atletico Madrid, the phantom goal as it became known to Catalans, who remember that season for many reasons. I remember the goal he scored against Atletico Madrid and the 5-0 victory in the Bernabeu when we played with Mora and De Portero. Real Madrid against Barcelona at the Bernabeu was perhaps the most famous match Cruyff ever played for Barcelona. It was fantastic for me as a player to play Madrid. It was such a, a, a huge thing, first to play in Bernabeu, and then if you saw the game, we played very well. Barcelona didn't just play well, they won 5-0. <laughs> I think that for those of us who were lucky enough to play in that team, we'll remember that match forever. Things were beginning to change in Spain. People were starting to be able to say what they thought politically. And in that sense, a result like that against a team like Madrid, in their own ground, sent shockwaves around Europe. Almost every Catalan saw this as a symbolic victory over Madrid. At the time, Spain was still under the dictatorship of Franco, a particularly tough time for Catalonia. Afterwards, when you live here, then you see the differences between uh, Catalonia and Franco at that time, and uh, what it meant for them to have the best player of Europe at that time, because they gave me the, the golden boy uh, ball a few times. And uh, so for them it was something that, uh, OK, uh, we out, uh, outplayed, let's say, Madrid. 1974 was also a World Cup year, and Holland arrived in West Germany with Cruyff, the best player in the world at the time, and with a growing reputation as a footballing nation. 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, all these summers, a Dutch team was in the final of the European Cup then everybody realized, hey, we've got a big name to defend now. We, five years of dominating Europe, we can't be, look like fools, it's impossible. But Holland were never going to look like fools. Stars like Johan Neeskens, Johnny Rett, as well as Cruyff himself would see to that. It's not a question of pre uh, pressure, it was more responsibility. Michaels was a big help because he arranged the organization outside the field and I could arrange it inside the field. Once again, it was the cruyff michels partnership. They'd been together at Ajax, then Barcelona, and now with Holland, they brought total football to the World Cup. It just grew naturally from that base. Nobody really consciously made up this style. 
We had attacking defenders, midfielders who played deep, and everyone attacked. This became what is known as total football. Against Sweden, Cruyff produced the move that defined his talents. It took a couple of seconds to lose the defender, but we've been talking about the Cruyff turn ever since. I never did uh, on the training or, or in free times tricks. I, I, I never did tricks. I saw something and I did it, and, and, uh, and it just came out. There was an opponent there and, and you had to outplay him, so that was the easiest way, so you just do it. Against Argentina, Cruyff got his first goal of the tournament. The orange machine was gathering force, but the biggest challenge was still to come. The big game was against Brazil. The world champions, uh, that was really a game where everybody was focused. We didn't only outplay the Brazilians, but we outplayed them with the best football. We just played football which the world loved, and, and, and that against the Brazilians. After 65 minutes, Cruyff produced a clinical finish to another flamboyant Dutch move. Holland were in the final. They were to face the hosts, West Germany, but they arrived at Munich's Olympiastadion in confident mood. We knew we were much better. We were not afraid at all. It was an extraordinary start to a World Cup final. Cruyff picked up the ball and took on the German defence. He got a penalty. And Johan Neeskins blasted it home. Holland were ahead before any West German player had even touched the ball. We knew they were Germans. Germans is always difficult. It's one of their qualities, their mentality, and uh, they will go until the end. The Germans fought back. They too won a penalty, which Paul Breitner drove home. The German reaction didn't stop there, and by half time they were ahead, this time through Gerd Muller. played a little too confident and we missed such a lot of chances, such a lot of chances. So we played quite well, but the details were not there. And, and you saw it in too many, too many small different details. And one of the things were, uh, were uh, scoring the goals. So Cruyff and his Dutch team that had captured the imagination of so many finished as the losing finalists. We really had a great time there. It was just a shame we didn't win the final. We kind of forgot we had to win, which was a shame. Never saw me. Yeah, <laughs> but like I said, maybe we're too confident. Yeah, that's a good expression. That's very good. He may have been on the losing side, but that team made a lasting impression on Dutch football. Cruyff and his side of 1974 were the inspiration for the generations that followed. It started with Cruyff. And yeah, he's, he's like the godfather of, uh, of Dutch football. When I was 10 or 9 or 11, playing on the street, watching television, I saw Van Aanegem, I saw Janssen or Krol or Neeskens or Cruyff. And for me, that's, that's the, 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 the great uh, Dutch generation. He inspired us uh, a lot, all the youth of, uh, of Holland. And uh, I think uh, we all young boys wanted to play like him. Feeling increasingly pressurised by international football, Cruyff decided that would be his last World Cup. There was also an attempt to kidnap his family. I made the decision to stop in 78. And, and, and not that I, I, I didn't uh, mention it a, a month before or two months before. I said already four or five years before. I didn't go to the world champion in 78 too because I, uh, we had a problem at home people who made an attack on us. So I said, hey, I'm in the wrong time, uh, too many crazy people, let's, let's calm down. In 1974, Cruyff was named the European Player of the Year for a third time, as he continued as Barcelona's star. For many, he's the most influential player the club has ever had. Johan revolutionized, revolutionized the city and the country. He transformed Barcelona and Catalonia because during his time here, he turned football into an art form. Johan was innovative and a breath of fresh air. It was an extraordinary feeling and he touched a lot of people. 
After five years at Barcelona, 48 goals and 143 appearances, Cruyff retired from football for a short time, but he wasn't away for long. I went to the United States. It was a great experience. I, I learned there a lot of things, a lot of things, especially in managing and all these sort of things. Watch now as Johan Cruyff demonstrates both grace and poise and explosiveness. This poise and explosiveness from perhaps the greatest player active in the sport of soccer today. He cuts between defenders, goes to his left, and left puts the goal into the back of the net. He did. Thank you, Johan Cruyff and Chris Dangerfield. Five of the seven goals tonight, and good luck to you in the playoff. Thanks so much. OK, back to you, Tom. After spells with the Los Angeles Aztecs and the Washington Diplomats, Cruyff felt the time was right to head home. And he made a spectacular return for Ajax against Harlem. There was a lot of skepticism in, in the way that he was. You know, he did have an age, and how was he going to be? And I think even the first half he did some, you know, he just made an unbelievable goal. And uh, I think that was probably one of the moments where I was most proud of all, you know, because your classmates... And everybody, you know, how is your father going to play? And when he, he put up that show, you know, it was for me uh, an incredible moment. There were more incredible moments to come, including the famous pass from a penalty. He scored 14 goals, 36 games in his second Ajax spell. But perhaps the biggest surprise of all was when he put on the shirt of rivals Feyenoord and actually scored against his former team. Then as head coach back at Ajax, he won the European Cup Winners' Cup in 1987 with a goal from his protégé, Marco van Basten. And when he took the job as head coach at Barcelona, Cruyff's career had come full circle. It took some time, work and, and, and to be strong inside to, to achieve what we wanted to achieve. And it was the way we played with Holland, the way we played uh, with Ajax and... Uh, and, and, and I thought you could have the possibilities here to do the same thing here and, uh, and uh, that's what he achieved. Back at Barcelona, Cruyff put together a team that played football how he wanted the game to be played. They called it El Dream Team and they even managed to beat Real Madrid 5-0 as well. Barcelona gave Cruyff the opportunity to put his footballing philosophy into practice. And there you had the example in the famous dream team that won consecutive titles. So Johan and the club's ideas became inseparable. They were synonymous with each other. But perhaps Cruyff's finest achievement in all the years he's been associated with Barcelona was to win the European Cup in 1992. Ronald Koeman scored in a 1-0 win against Sampdoria at Wembley. It was a club which almost 100 years have existed, never won it. And, uh, and now you didn't only win it, but the way you won it. They don't talk about you, no, no, you won the game. No, no, we enjoy watching. And enjoy watching the game from Barcelona is much more important than only winning. Even now his life still revolves around sport. The Johan Cruyff Institute for Sport Studies has centres around the world, helping athletes build their future careers. And the Cruyff Foundation helps kids who didn't have the chance to excel at sport. I was very happy myself. The thing is achieved, but if you see these kids and you see, just, just don't see their handicap, but just watch in their eyes, it's something so nice, so beautiful. I think I'm very fortunate that uh, I can do something for these two. It all started on a football pitch in Amsterdam, but by the time that Cruyff had played his last game, he could be spoken about as one of the very greatest players of all time. I think he's one of those, uh, you know, the legends who's always, whose name is always going to be uh, spoken about with, uh, you know, with the uh, Pelés, the Maradonas. The rest of us, we're just uh, mortals, you know, uh, we come and we go. Johan Cruyff, Maradona, uh, Pelé, uh, Eusebio, they were all fantastic players, but you know, Johan was uh, the greatest. You can be proud of it, or you have to be proud of it. Um, and uh, from that stage on, to be proud, uh, don't think about it too much, because you might get uh, big-headed or whatever. But uh, it's just uh, that I had a fantastic career.
where I uh, enjoyed myself very much.